I'm here with the creative team behind a film, two films, uh, the third Saturday in October, part five, and then part one. If you've seen it, it makes sense. And uh, so we're here with uh, Jay Burleson, uh, Antonio Woodruff, and Kansas Bowling. And let me bring you all. Whoops, I don't want to be in the focus there. Let's be all equal. Hey, thanks for joining. Hey, thanks for having us. <laughs> Hi. So uh, this is kind of fun. Uh, we're, we're just past halfway to Halloween, and it's nowhere near the third Saturday in October when we're having this conversation. But, uh, you know, I, I just want to begin with the, probably the weirdest compliment, or, or maybe you get this all, all a lot. For a parody slasher film, your movie is almost too good. Well, thank you. So, you, it, it's too well, well done. Take that. <laughs> but you, you do uh, recreate the video store slasher era so well. Uh, in fact, I, I invited a friend over who's a big horror fan uh, to watch the screeners. And he said that was exactly how he'd experienced many of the, of the franchises like out of order. Cause that was just what w was there. Uh, what, what drew you to this as a subject matter? Well, I had wanted to make my own lost slasher series for years. And I had the concept based around the third Saturday, in October and, uh, being from Alabama, wanting to kind of take the formula of Halloween or Friday the 13th and apply college football and the pageantry of that, as well as like the small town nature of how I grew up here in Alabama, and I'm sure it's similar to how you grew up here as well. Um, so at the time that we made part five, we were working on a, a different project a couple for a couple of years, trying to get it off the ground. And it was like a much more art house slasher, bigger budget, completely different vibe than what we ended up making. But we had a lot of momentum and we didn't have the resources that we needed. And I just decided that it made the most sense to try to make one of these lost slasher films that it would be the most accessible thing to do that we could have a lot of fun with and lean into the absurdity of how those series would go off the rails over time. And um, we didn't start out with the idea that we're gonna make part one after part five. I knew I wanted to make more of them and about a year after we shot part five, we had the opportunity to make part one and it just made sense to have two of them at the same time. And that's where the double feature aspect of it really came into play. So it developed over, you know, that year to two year process. And again, uh, why not be with just a straightforward slasher, slasher film? Like I said, it, it's actually, I mean, there are some jokes which, you know, land very clearly like, I'm not a sports fan, but even Harding has to stop and watch the football game, which just made me laugh really hard. Uh, so, you know, why not just do a straightforward slasher pick? Yeah, so I love the later sequels, like Halloween 4 and 5. I love the energy that those movies have, that Friday the 13th has. So we didn't approach it as we're going to make a parody. I looked at it more as an experiment of, what would a part five look like in this fictional franchise? It doesn't exist, but we get to creatively come up with the language and the backstory and build that world. And what would that look like from my perspective and just like my weird sensibilities? And that's really what led to part five. And then part one then becomes like retracing my steps and making a lot of those decisions make sense in the original film, like why he wears a suit, why he drives a hearse and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so how can you make sure, like, I got the screeners with a very strict note from the publicist, watch it five first, and then go back to the first one. So how can you make sure, besides going to every household that rents this, uh, that they're going to watch this in the order that you intended? Yeah, so we're definitely trying to get the word out through the distributor and just the word of mouth that we can do and the festivals that we played out were very kind and accommodating the double feature aspect and playing part five first. Ultimately, I don't think it matters overall if you watch part one first and don't even know part five exists or if you do it the way we suggest. Uh, we just wanted to try to create that experience for as many people that wanted to participate in it as possible. And then however people ultimately end up finding the films is, is cool with us. That's like what Neil Breen does. If, if you buy a DVD from Neil Breen, only three people are allowed to watch it at once or else you need permission from him. That's what he says on his website. 
That's awesome. We we could definitely do that. <laughs> So you should cool. have that that <laughs> that kind of control over your audience, right? Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so, what's the casting process like? So, Antonio, you know, have you did you always you know know from the beginning of this project, Antonio is going to be the killer, uh, Kansas is going to be the final girl. So it's kind of uh, magical how Antonio and I met. My friend Andrew Wasserberger was playing Harding in Part Five and he was volunteering his time as well as his suits. So we saw a couple of actors that had the same suit size just so we would have somebody to step in for Andrew if he was unavailable. And then his wife gave birth to their first child and this guy had shown up to a Panera Bread parking lot and walked around in the suit for us. So I replaced one of my closest friends with him and then he became a really close friend instantly. And at that point we knew when we make part one, he's, he's gonna, Come this is like the, the Hollywood dream, like Schwab's, yeah. uh, you know, Panera's the new Schwab's. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> but and but I was for Kansas, I knew that from the beginning, like I want Kansas to play this role. And thankfully she was kind enough to, to come to Alabama and make the movie with us. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this out of Burbank where right on the corner is a sound studio, you know, mm -hmm. and there's four post-production buildings on my street. So, you know, what, what's the, what's the challenge in doing this in Alabama? It actually makes a lot of things easier. You know, a lot of the picture cards we got, especially in part one, but for both films, um, Here's, people I, just... I could not believe it. The hospital let us film in the hospital. <laughs> blew yeah, my right. mind. But you brought up like, the picture a cards. Local filmmaker, they were like, yeah, here, we'll shut down an entire floor of the hospital. Whole floor. Whole floor. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, people okay. are really, really excited about helping you out in a place like Alabama. And these movies could only really be made the way they are in Alabama. Alabama. I think that's part of the regional charm of the, the football aspect and everything as well. Yeah, the, yeah, the picture cars. That's actually, we, when I was, my friend and I were watching it, we were both so impressed by how consistently of each era your cars were. Yes. How yeah, did you we're do really, <laughs> We're really proud of the production design elements. Um, I mean, a lot of those cars, one night we went to downtown Athens, Alabama for a car show and said we're shooting at um, a, a burger restaurant that doesn't exist that we made up for this movie tomorrow at 10 a.m. Would you bring your car? We had like 15 cars show up that day. So it was really a lot of that. And people would, um, some of the main picture cars like uh, Ricky Dean's car, as well as Heather Hill's Mustang, those people would just let us keep the cars. That Mustang was in our garage for like the entire shoot. They were just so thrilled with it, the idea of the car being in a movie. So there was a lot of that in every aspect of how we made the movies. <laughs> uh, you know, Kansas, we talk about, you know, Antonio was in Panera. How did you uh, get involved? Uh, you know, were you looking for a sandwich as well? <laughs> uh, no, Jay, Jay reached out to me through a mutual friend and, um, he sent the script and then I went and watched his other movie, The Nobodies. And I, I really liked The Nobodies. I thought it was really good. So I was just like, count me in. Okay. <laughs> I, I want to point people to that. I mean, because this is not your first horror film parody. And as well, you've done a, a Halloween fan film. So I, you know. Yeah, a trailer, that, which we, some of that footage is in part five. I've recycled it into the Oh, that, archive. okay. Mm -hmm. We had that question too. Are there... In part five, it begins with a, a recap. Are there shots from two, three, and four? We did a couple of things that are supposed to mimic either two, three, or four, just to have more footage to choose from of Harding or some of that, the defining elements of the world that we built. But uh, yeah, we just shot some of that stuff for that montage. If we went back and made those sequels, you know, it would be completely different. We just needed something to fill that gap and to make it feel full. Did did you have uh, any any difficulty kind of keeping that tone between uh, that uh, you know the the Halloween uh, initial uh, par parody there of seven, of nineteen seventy eight and nineteen ninety four? Were there moments where like no, this would have fit in a seventy eight? Like, what's the difference in the slasher films when the franchises go on? We were disappointed this was not uh, Harding in space because we believe by number five they should be in space. 
Right. Yeah, it was a, it was a conscious decision not to go down that road with part five and like make it too ridiculous and, and kind of lose its accessibility. To me, it was just about trying to make the most specific like Southern slasher movie that you could and lean into the part five aspects of it just because we knew that the movie was going to be made uh, to be held together pretty much with like Elmer's glue and duct tape, you know, like that was kind of the spirit of how we were making it. So that's how we envision part five. It's just like this low budget um, production that was just kind of held together by duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Kansas, this uh, this will include you too. Is that the part five sets up what they wouldn't have known in '94, but the the legacy sequel? Because we're figuring this is right before Scream, so mm-hmm. horror films hadn't been that self aware. But the last five years, I've seen we've seen so many revisits. Would you consider doing that going down down the road and saying like it's it, it, it's the third Saturday in October, twenty years later? Would I be down for that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <duh. laughs> but I think this is also on to you know on, on to Jay and Antonio. I'll, uh, I'll do I'll do third Saturday in October movies till the day I die. Thank you. That's good yeah. to know because I got plenty of ideas. <laughs> okay, good. good. <laughs> so I do have a, a Halloween H two O inspired idea that would bring Ricky Dean and some of the characters from Part One back into a Part Six that would also feature. Maggie and PJ from part five. So it would kind of be a trilogy between one, five, and six. And it would be like post scream late 90s mm-hmm. Asian films influenced. Okay. Uh, Antonio, did you find a challenge? I mean, your version of Harding is the one that until he gets the mask, which that that was also such a, a nice touch. Uh, going back to the first one, like the mask at the very at, at the very end yeah. is completely silent as a killer. Also spends a lot of time just hanging around watching people. Uh, so, you know, did you have, a, you know, anything in trying to come up with a characterization that, you know, you're limited by you can't actually speak? I think I grew into it due to the fact I'm a wrestling fan. So I was a big Undertaker fan. And when the Undertaker came out, everything about him was his action, his movement. Uh, could you sell it? I think me and Jay spent a lot of time with him just really just encouraging, like allowing me to be me, allowing me to find that element of who I wanted to become in the movie. And it just allowed me to relax, be calm, and just find this role of just locking in and being great. It just not having lines, but being able to just, you got to make your action. You know, I got to bring everything to the table through my action. And it just came out. We grow together and we spent so much time me and him are goofy together, so it made it so much easier working with him. <laughs> we became, like he said, we became like and if, if you hadn't come on board, the laughing that Harding does wouldn't have existed. Oh, That's something that yes. just like so right for it's you. It, it, and the dancing too. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. once Antonio came on board, there were so many characteristics that he brought to it. And I would throw him, you know, random things like <laughs> we're gonna have you dance at the end of the scene, and yeah. it just felt right. <laughs> Uh, you know, Kansas, your first film uh, as a director was also a slasher film. So uh, obviously all, all three of you are, are heavily influenced by them. So, you know, for you, Kansas, I ask is, is what draws you to it as a genre? Um, I, I've just always loved horror movies. Um, I wanted to start with a slasher movie. Well, I'll start with a horror movie because... Um, it was Roger Corman's advice that I was taking, so, (laughs) um, I can't particularly pinpoint what draws me to slashers in general, but horror is sort of, um, the genre that has the most, um, experimentation in it. Um, yeah, (laughs) that's a tough one to answer. Well, who's your favorite final girl? Oh, um, oh, uh, Sally Hardesty in Texas Chainsaw Massacre. All right. How about how about you two? Nancy, Nightmare on Elm Street. Oh man, why well, you have to take mine? <laughs> you can you share can it. it too. You yeah. can share it. It yeah. was Nancy. 
Yeah. Yeah. And so I would assume Nightmare and, and I, I saw a little touch of Texas Chainsaw Massacre as well. What 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 films influenced you, Jay, in growing up? And because, again, this is not the first time you've done a, a parody or in, in the Halloween trailer, an homage. Yeah. So I grew up with the big slashers for sure. Halloween, the original, was uh, a huge influence on me. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, I've watched all the Nightmare on Elm Street and uh, Friday the 13th films by the time I was like 10 years old. So all of that stuff, those were my earliest influences. And I definitely leaned in for part five, leaned into Halloween 4 and 5 and Friday the 13th, part six. Uh, part one was more influenced by, you know, obviously Halloween, the storyline is there. But um, visually, we were looking more like Black Christmas, the original Black Christmas, original uh, I, I Yes, I... I, I... I tagged that. I, it's like I was making notes like, oh, I think I recognize this from that one. So Black Christmas yeah. gets overlooked. Yeah. So I'd ask that, you know, are there other, are there kind of the underrated or overlooked films from that era that you think most, that a lot of people don't know about that you would recommend? Besides your own? About, no. Um, well, uh, an 80s zombie movie, late 80s zombie movie called Flesh Eater. Bill Heinzman directed it. He plays the original Cemetery Ghoul and Night of the Living Dead. He mm -hmm. basically plays the same character in Flesh Eater, and that was a big influence on Part 5. Um, underrated, I, I'm not so sure, but some that I don't mention as much as references for Part 5, I would say um, Return of the Living Dead 1 and 2. The comedic tones of those movies really were kind of like a foundation for me and like the type of content that I liked. Um, part one definitely has some phantasm influence and um, Hills Have Eyes as well, just from a visual standpoint. Antonio, Kansas, any favorite we haven't talked about? Go um, I don't know. It's like, it's hard to think of when I'm on the spot. I'm sure I, I, <laughs> I have the, like a super underrated favorite slasher that I just can't think of right now. I don't horror movies in general yes i'll open that up yeah um uh one of my favorite movies right now is um the witch who came from the sea which not many people have seen um directed by robert tom who wrote death race 2000 stars millie perkins who was who played anne frank um it's all set in like um 70s santa monica when it was like kind of sketchy still um I guess it's kind of a slasher in a weird way. Um, I'll, you know, I'll go with horror. I haven't heard of that, so that's uh, I'll have to look yeah. that one up. Yeah, Kansas has deep knowledge of cinema, and I'm always very impressed. By <laughs> it. I love to be able to talk. Yeah, definitely for me, original Candyman. Um, definitely original Candyman. Yeah, Candyman's yeah. great. And before we send any Fanboy Planet viewer to any of those other ones, of course, you need to. Uh, get third saturday in october the third saturday in october part five uh hitting video on demand on may 5th and then you can go back to the third saturday in october which is uh, you know kansas is not in there in that one but uh but antonio clearly is and uh, <laughs> both uh terrifying and hilarious at the same time in a yeah. very very weird way so we had a lot of fun thank you for joining me today and and, and talking about it and uh Best of luck with this. Hey, thanks Thank a lot, Jerry. Thanks for having us. Thank you for watching. Please be sure to creepily caress the subscribe button to be sure you don't miss out on any ghoulish gifts from the fanboy planet crypt and who knows i may one day find my way back out of the catacombs and into dim light again <laughs>